All right. Um, I, thank you for your patience, everyone. I know that was uh, probably a little longer than we were expecting there. Um, we're going to go ahead and pick back up with where we were. Uh, we're actually going to move to item B, well, uh, B under item four there, the Hewlett Spencer Bell report. Good to see you, Jamie. Hello. Is this on? Yes, sir. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Good to see you all, too. Appreciate it. Um, uh, I'll give you the uh, 30,000 foot view report from the last time we were here. Of course, you guys get the Ross Bryan Independent Inspecting Engineer report. So essentially, sometimes I'm sort of regurgitating what you'll read in that sh short synopsis. But what you're hearing from me is literally the latest up to date thing. Sometimes that may be a day or two or a week old. So with that being said, all the exterior brick on the building uh, is 100 percent complete. Um, all the exterior uh, roofing is 100 percent complete. Uh, we even got the roof on the little mechanical building that we built uh, in the back. Um, the interior drywall is completed on the first floor and uh, we're hanging drywall on the second floor. Started that this week. So uh, moving right along. The rough ends, um, plumbing, mechanical rough ends uh, are completed. The duct work is complete in most all the areas. And of course, I'm giving you generalities. Um, the painting, has, uh, as you know, we reported that started the last time I was here. We've got the painting and the first coat complete on most all of the first floor of the building and starting painting up on the second floor. Uh, the permanent power to the building should be connected and turned on tomorrow. That's a big, uh, that's a, that's a big step for us to get that on, which means that we'll be able to start the elevator uh, working uh, next week once the permanent power is turned on in the building. The exterior windows and door frames, uh, uh, 85, 90 percent done uh, on the exterior of the building. On the inside of the building, the uh, door frames are, are 100 percent. Windows are going in on the interior now. Uh, bathroom tile is even getting started. So you can kind of see where we're at. We're dried in. Uh, uh, we've got heat in the building. Uh, if you walk through now, the guys are a little more comfortable. They're not working in 20 degree weather when it's that cold outside. We, we're blowing heat. They're more comfortable. They're able to get a lot of things done. This is when the building really starts rolling and we can move pretty fast. Things will start going at a rapid pace now that we're inside and, and dried in. Also, all the concrete and all the stairs are poured. So every stairwell in the entire uh, building there is, is complete now. And, and by the way, we have eight different stairwells in that, in that building. Uh, and then lastly, I'll just say that we're still on schedule. That's the most important part of this report. Uh, we're still planning on handing the school over to Stan and, and, the, and uh, Roger uh, 1st of July. Uh, July 4th is kind of the date, but of course we would like and have had conversations about getting them in or staging them in prior to that if we can uh, be complete in some areas, maybe around the middle of June we talked about, which I know would be great. You know, any extra time we can give them to, to load the school is, is better. So. Uh, with that said, I also dropped off a couple aerials at each of your stations just so you could take a look. Those are very recent aerials taken by airplane this, this week. And uh, so you can kind of see what the buildings look looks like from the sky, the pretty roof and all the mechanical units up there. And things are starting to take shape. And of course, when this phase is over, a lot of the buildings there, some of the structures behind the new building won't be there anymore. So we'll be starting in phase two of the project uh, at that time. So. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll take any questions that you guys may have at this time on, on the construction. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Lindsey. Uh, not that it really matters. It's just out of curiosity. But with the brick being done, why is the scaffolding still up in the front and on the yeah. north side? And I don't know. I'm not good with directions. But yeah. I, I'm just curious. I ride by and I notice the brick's done, but there's still a lot of scaffolding. Honestly, up. that scaffolding still that still there because it was so cold the last few the days that they were supposed to come and take that down and move and uh, that they just hadn't got it down yet. I noticed that it was up too, and we talked about it specifically just in that one couple uh, area or two. Yeah, it just hadn't got it down yet. Well, like I said, it was it's kind of irrelevant. And I was just out of curiosity. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Does anyone else have any other questions or discussion on that? Okay, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, underneath that, we did have another item here, an invoice, 16-001. Uh, uh, let's see, SSOE changed to structural, saying there is a vote required on that. Um, Mr. Bates. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, looking at that change order, it looks like it's a $217,480 change order request from Hewlett Spencer that uh, we reviewed. And if I understand it correctly, that uh, if we adopted that change order, that would actually increase our guaranteed maximum price. And so, uh, and the background of looking into this issue, it looks like there was maybe an issue with a seismic study where it ended up being a design change and ended up uh, causing some extra cost with uh, some of the foundation uh, out at Central High School. And um, so we've actually, uh, we've had an opportunity to meet with our attorney to kind of explore uh, this particular change order and some of the other issues in this case. Now, it, it, I will, and I'm about to make a motion in a moment, but I will say that it looks like our representative, Hewlett Spencer, uh, caught this issue with the uh, seismic uh, study and was able to uh, get some resolution on that. Ended up saving quite a bit of money instead of about $200,000, uh, uh, or instead of about $600,000 of what the extra expense would have been, it ended up uh, saving where uh, we've ended up having about the $200,000 extra expense. But the issue before us right now is this change order from a legal standpoint of whether we should approve this change order, which would increase the guaranteed maximum price uh, on the contract. And uh, we've had our attorney who has uh, reviewed the contract with us. And uh, based upon our advice of counsel, I believe that it's not appropriate for us to approve the change order, which again would increase our guaranteed maximum price. And it looks like under our contract with Hewlett Spencer, there was some provision for discretionary type issues for unforeseen circumstances uh, that, that could, could arise. So, but we still have an issue. We, we've incurred these costs, and uh, that is, uh, I think, a concern of myself at least. Uh, but uh, so we do have an issue uh, of these costs that were incurred, and um, I think in part of our due, our due diligence, uh, I would like for us to explore our legal options uh, as to this, this extra cost, what are the county's uh, and the board's options. Now, of course, um, we don't have the expertise, we're not engineers, to be able to examine these seismic studies and be able to figure out what should have been done or what should not have been done. And our attorney doesn't have that expertise as well. But it looks like we currently have an independent engineer that we've been using. Uh, let's see, it's Ross Bryan and Associates, I believe, that has been looking at this particular project. So I'm going to make a motion that we decline the change order but we authorize our attorney to explore our legal options regarding these extra expenses that were incurred related to the underlying uh, change order request. And then we also authorize our attorney to consult with Ross Bryan and Associates to uh, get their perspective on things regarding this uh, extra expense. So that would be my motion, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bates. So we have a motion. Um, I may have to get ask you to restate that again, but I think I got it. And, and we do have a second. Uh, is there any discussion on that motion? Okay. Uh, seeing no discussion, and again, I'll make sure I get this correct. Um, uh, we have a motion to uh, d decline the invoice, uh, the change order, uh, but to have our legal counsel, Jake, uh, move forward with uh, Ross Bryan and Associates to explore what our options are as far as uh, how this took place and maybe what we need to do next. Okay. Uh, that being the motion, uh, all in favor? Mr. Chairman, excuse me, was there a second? We didn't get that. There was, Mr. Here. Morrison. Mr. Morrison. Apologies. Thank you. I did ask for a second. So, uh, no discussion on that. Uh, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that motion did pass. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Next thing we do have here is, is item number C is the train report. And I tell you what, I may I may speed you up a little bit. Is there any any high points other? I, I I'm assuming the rest of the board has had a chance to look at that report. Um, if, I'm not trying to cut you off. If there's something you really feel like you need to tell us, that's fine. No, I don't. Um, uh, it, it, does any board member have anything that is that stands out that you do want to ask about, Mr. Lasseter? Let's talk about Hampshire. Okay. So, won't be long. We'll be running into warm weather, and. What kind, of, what kind of game plan do we need to come up with to assure us that next school year, not just this continuing this 
warm weather, but next year that we are going to be able to cool the building and in the wintertime be able to heat the building. I understand. Okay. So a little background, the current scenario, if you will, is you have a, a chiller that currently supplies all the cooling water for the system. That chiller has been temporarily repaired. It's not permanently repairable cost effectively. So um, we try and put in a, y'all paid for it, but we installed a, a new compressor in that chiller to get it running with the condenser coil leaking um, to get you through summer into the fall. During the fall, uh, maintenance pulled out the uh, refrigerant and put a nitrogen charge on it just to kind of try to preserve as much as you can. But that's really a, a short-term fix on um, that piece of it. Um, I believe we, in the initial audit, looked at uh, doing a pretty much a whole school retrofit to that uh, school, which would be doing away with a hydronic system and going back with a DX type system. That would, it's not as complicated as the Withorn project because the school's not a big and it's not as, um, not a water source heat pump system, but it, it's still a very extensive project to try to get done in what I would say would be the ideal scenario, which would be the summer break. So when would we need to we would, when do we need to let, if, if we chose to do that, when would you all need to we would, start design and purchase and everything to be really, done by really start of by school? next month, we would need to. We would have to go through a design phase of it. Uh, you're, most of that equipment, you're probably looking at six to eight weeks on. Um, we may be able to expedite it some, but we would need generally the whole summer to, re, to do, do a project of that side. Size. So by next month, I'm just trying to figure out time wise <clears throat> when when we if if we choose to do this, when we would have to give the okay, then we have to come up with money. If it's coming out of fund balance, then the county commission's got to approve that. And we gotta do all this in time for them to be done for the start of school. And hopefully, hopefully it's gonna start up you know, whenever we turn the, the chiller on this year. Right. But so you're saying that that you would need the OK from us to start next month or you would start needing money next month if we chose to go this way? No, we would need the OK to proceed. <clears throat> Thank you. And, and just to clear, I, for, clarify on some of the terms, since I'm not a HVAC expert, I mean, you're, you are talking about uh, doing away with the kind of the whole building system we're talking about it's going to be more of a separate units yes it will be very similar to uh, the 400 hall at Kalioka if you're all familiar with them with that approach okay all right Mr. Penix uh, it was right around a million one slightly over a million uh, the original I can't get on but anyway the original quote that they gave us um, is in your packet. It's actually listed on your project list there. Um, if you look at the, the future projects, I'll find it here in just a second. But the, um, when we talked, I think when we, a million ten thousand seven hundred forty-one dollars I think when we talked yesterday, John, with Owen, he said there might, that, that price was given to us about 18 months ago, so there might be a slight three to five percent increase over that they'd have to go back and recost it for sure so we did have a discussion about that yesterday in our meeting when we met with train thank you and we had mr nevada on the phone with us mr dudley thank you uh Kalioka, what kind of problems are we issues we're still having at Kalioka? uh we're having quite a bit of water related issues still with uh, units that are not getting proper heat exchanger, tra heat transfer through the heat exchanger. I uh, know we have uh, the auditorium unit uh, went down. I believe you have pricing for a replacement of that unit. And then there's also a classroom unit that uh, 
we're recommending you replace. Okay. Mr. Lindsay. You, you made a statement a while ago talking about Hampshire. You said it was not cost effective. And, and I don't know, I'm probably putting you on the spot, but right. do you know what that cost would be to repair what's there? I do not. Um, in addition to the chiller, I mean, one option may be to replace that chiller, but the rest of the equipment is aged also. We know the chiller is on its last leg. Mr. Lasseter. So I guess for Mr. Breeden, do we have any kind of plan of attack for Hampshire or you know, have you guys come up with a timeline that we need to make a decision? No, sir, if you'll remember, and, and I, we recommended last fall that we include this in the money that you took from fund balance for this year and you all chose to wait, so we're kind of waiting on you now. Um, we, um, we, you know, are purely at the direction of this board, what you would have to do. My assumption would be that this is one of the areas that as we, again, I'm not, not to put everything off on the assessment, but this is going to be an area that is going to be covered in that assessment and will yes, be sir. prioritized accordingly, I would assume in there. Okay. Yes, sir. It, it will. And they will be prioritized list with that. Mr. Dudley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the last page of Train's report of attachment six, there's a statement saying that you're out of money. Have we got a request to give them more money for service work, service POs or? or can, I, I'll speak to that. Mr. Dudley, actually, I was looking at that today. We just got that report uh, the day that we put together your packet, so we did not have time to put together. A, um, it, train, the train folks were in a meeting last week, and so we, they couldn't get the report to us till Friday. We got that report. We knew already, or we'd already gotten the things, knew that the stuff was coming for the, uh, the other recommendations, the replacement of the two units at Cully Oak and the one at Howe. That leaves us about $35,000 left in the 100,000 that you all have designated for HVAC repairs out of the capital funds that we have for this year. You know, we didn't put a recommendation, but it would certainly, I think, be prudent to go ahead and authorize us to, you know, spend the rest of that money and opening another PO for repairs like they've been doing, because we continue to have repair work that needs to be done. Uh, I was looking for my list. There is, I think about, I put the list together today and I've got it here on my phone, but I think it's about seven or eight units that we still have known issues at Cullioca. Parts have been ordered on most of those. I think there's two or three, they're still troubleshooting. Uh, as John uh, said, most of those, uh, we still continue to have water problem with the water loop, which, which can cause errors. What happens is the water flow is restricted because of the the debris in the loop and so what that will do is the unit if it doesn't get enough water flow it will shut down and give you an error so what you have to do is you have to clean out a strainer or or back flush the unit to get the water flow again and those those errors can happen periodically but in addition to that we have about seven that we still got some parts on order so we're, we're working on that the um, we have made we had a, a meeting was that two weeks ago with our water treatment company and train all there together. We, we've, we've put a plan of attack together. We've put a new filter on the unit. Train is actually look, and that filter over time will clean up because it's what our water uh, treatment company provides typically. It's, but train has even suggested a more aggressive approach. And so they're looking to see what the cost would be to add a, it's a matter of the volume that goes through the filter. You know, the, the line itself, I, I don't know how big it is, but it's a, it's a big pipe. But we put a small pipe going down through the filter. So if you want to get it filtered quick, more quickly, cleaned up, more, you need a bigger filter with a bigger pipe on it. Well, that's a much more expensive. The filter we bought, $800 that we put on there. We might be talking about a filter that's several thousand dollars to purchase or maybe hundreds of dollars per month to rent. 
which which we're looking at. So so that is the long term goal is to get the the loop cleaned up. Short term goal is to continue to fix these units. So again, we probably uh, that's a long answer to tell you we probably need to you know go ahead and authorize the rest of that money that's left in that hundred thousand to be open for a repair PO, which is what we've been operating under with them. So you're you're saying thirty five thousand of that is what's left, or, or yes, sir. If you or, approve the repair of these three, the replacement of the three units that are broken that we've got on the agenda for this evening. Well, I mean, I, I certainly, I think we're making progress. It, it's it's that way. Every time we make two steps forward, it seems like we're making three steps backwards uh, because of of the equipment equipment failures or, or whatever but but I think overall we're making progress and I'd hate to see us not be able to continue and I'd hate for us to have classrooms that are not usable because of, of of we can't keep them warm or we can't keep them cool in the in the upcoming months so uh, if it's appropriate I'd like to make a motion that would allow make a recommendation to go ahead and allow the additional 35,000 be spent on train projects. Let, let me give you, because I just found it in my notes, it's actually $32,451 is right. the exact number. 32,451. No. Uh, so I put that in the form of a motion. All right, there we go. Uh, so we do have a motion. Um, do we have a second on that? And we have a second. Okay. Is there any discussion on that motion? That that this is separate and above from the rest of the items on here, correct? That's correct. The the uh, you have in your your uh, packet later on in the agenda recommendations to replace the unit in the auditorium at Kalioka, Room One Hundred One at Kalioka, and Room One Hundred Eight at Randolph Hall. The total of those three is sixty seven thousand five forty nine. So this this just fills out the rest of that hundred thousand that's still left in budgeted capital funds for this year that's remaining for HVAC repair. Okay, so we're just uh, moving this Same. over to a, a new PO for training. And it would be a PO items. for we open sep. It has to do with the way the purchasing contract is that we operate under. You have to do replacement purchases or a separate contract number than repair. And so what we do is we'll open a PO for the purchase of a replacement piece of equipment, but then you have a separate PO contract that you do repair work under, where they they just send a repairman out to deal with whatever the issue is there. Parts, it's a parts parts and labor, uh, time time and time and parts. Mr. Morrison. If it would be appropriate, I'd like to amend their motion to include items seven and eight uh, to fund those as well. Okay. And just to clarify that, I guess just go ahead and include all of this under one for the original 100000 I think, is where we were at. Okay. I mean, is, yeah. is that, did the numbers work out if that's where we're at? Sure. Okay. Yeah, that's a total of 100000 Okay. So uh, that being said, so, um, and that is, the second was corrected. Okay. Uh, so the motion as it is now is to approve items uh, well, bid 16054 bid 16055 as they're stated and those two total 67549 and the remainder of the $100,000 which would be the 32451 would be applied to a opening a uh, repair PO to apply to other repairs there Kalioka. that's correct okay any discussion on that Mr. Lassiter two questions one is that enough to carry us through till the next month's facility meeting. I would think so, yes. Okay. And also, where Stan was referring to the, the smaller filter that we have, <clears throat> as opposed to going to a larger one, the new units, are, are we running, do we do any of the water, the two-line water to the new units, or are they all standalones? Do you remember? The 400 hall is a standalone. It's a DX system. Every other unit besides the 400 hall does have the dirty, I'm going to call it dirty, the older water running through the new units. So are we doing, are we doing damage 
that could be prevented by going to a larger filter and and getting the sediment out quicker? Um, I don't think we are affecting the heat exchangers because they're seeing the same water. So yes, if you clean up the water quicker, you'll have less fouling associated with the heat exchanger. Okay. And so is, is this heat exchanger rebuildable or is it, you know, if you remember the ones that GM had that, that you know, came right. apart and you could change the. What, you, you have, you got plate and frame heat exchangers going back to like you had a GM. Uh, that is in for the whole system associated with the cooling tower to the, the water side of the water source heat pump. The heat exchangers we're talking about are individual. They're small in the units. Okay. Um, typically what we will get is just simply back flush them to clean them. Um, if they're real bad, we run a, a cleaning solution, pump it through it called red lime, and that cleans it up. Um, if for some reason they have froze, they are not rebuildable. They just replace them. So what's what's your recommendation on filters? Are we fine the way we are, or do we need to go? Do we need to go to a larger filter? Well, if I think you get where you need to be with the filter you have, it's just going to take a lot longer. Uh, the one that I think Trent, our train was looking at, has a two-inch inlet and outlet diameter. This one has a three-quarter. So. When you're dealing with a whole water side loop, it's you're not you're not getting the volume that you would on a, a larger uh, filter. You know, something with two inch diameter, right. and I believe it has a powered pump also, as opposed to simply running the head pressure from the system. In it. But you think that that the one we're using is uh, gonna as, is as gonna far, as far as I can tell, I've I've talked with the. Well, Stan and the water treatment guy, I have no problems with the size filters. I mean, they're using a one micron and a five micron. Um, it will get there. Uh, like I told them, basically we didn't treat the water for 30 years. Yeah. It's going to take a while to clean it up. And so all that settlement just settles in low velocity areas in the pipe. And sometimes that's your heat exchangers or any times you got restrictions. And yes, we flush the system, we dump the system, but simply opening up a, a valve to dump that water doesn't displace all that small, real fine sediment, but you, you gotta have that velocity to move that sediment around. Let, let me just add one thing to that discussion, if I could. John is much more the expert than I am, but what the result of the longer time to clean up is you experience more of these errors on the machine. So the machine, you'll come in in the morning and the classroom's cold because the machine shut down and so you have to clean the, clean the strainer out on the end and restart the unit. And so because these units, um, the particular units are in there, what, what I'm learning, and John can speak this better than me, the McQuay units have very sophisticated control systems in them that are very sensitive. So they shut, they're there to protect the equipment from tearing up, but they shut it down real quick. And so in the meantime, we're, we're, you know, it's, it's frustration for the teachers and for the administration because you have these, but eventually over time, it's gonna get fixed and these problems hopefully will go away, but we experience those in the meantime. So then you're happy with, even though we're experiencing difficulties, you think that it's, it's adequate to leave what we have and just try to fight them the best we can? At this point, not knowing what another one would cost, I don't know that I can answer that question. If it's uh, you know, if it's fifty thousand dollars to put another one on and you get it done in three months versus eight months, who right. who can? Or if it's that's probably a ridiculous example. It's ten thousand dollars. You know, is, is it is it? It's hard to quantify. Um, I do know that we're on a better track than we used to be, which meant we would just bypass all those sensors and put a thermostat on the wall, and then the unit would keep running, but eventually burn up. So we're you know, I think we're headed. I think we're, in, we're headed in a better direction. Mr. Lindsay. This is just a statement, not a question, but you guys, you made the statement, we, we went for 30 years without doing anything. 
and, and I can tell you, when I prepare for this meeting every month, I hate to open you guys' report because, it's, as, as Mr. Dudley said, it's two steps forward and three steps back. And, you know, uh, but I just want to, and I have to remind myself that we're uh, paying the price for things that happened years ago that nobody in this room had control over. Um, and, and it's, and, you know, like I said, I, I can't, um, sometimes I don't even look at your report because I'm afraid of what I'm going to see. But, uh, but it, you know, it's, and I, and I say this a bunch, we can't look backwards. There's no sense in us pointing fingers and what should have been. We can only move forward and, uh, it's costing us a bunch of money to move forward, but I think we'll be, I, I feel wholeheartedly we'll be better off for it down the road. And I, I appreciate what you guys do and, uh, Appreciate Mr. Breeden and Mr. Hall, you guys kind of being forward thinking with some of this stuff. And I am just glad we're not, even though it's costing us a bunch of money, I'm glad we're not doing the same thing that we've always done. So uh, uh, thanks. Thank you. Mr. Lindsay, I appreciate that. Mr. Lasser, too. I guess to get back to Mr. Lasser's point, I just want to make sure, do you feel like the solution we're working on now is the right one to solve this? I guess that's kind of the short answer. Or if there's something else, I think that was what Mr. Lasser was getting at. If there's something else we need to be doing, I'd sure like to know that you guys feel like is appropriate. I think we're heading down the right path. Um, I think we're still gathering some information on, on that larger filter mm -hmm. that will, you know, let us make some more educated decisions or recommendations or stand make <clears throat> better decisions on on the cost and uh, if it's it's kind of on that balancing point. Do okay. you really want to spend extra money on a larger filter to save a few months or even quantifying that time is, is are you saving two months or are you saving a year and a half? Okay. And again, I, I don't want to make that decision because I sure don't know how to make that decision. I just, I would just hope that as we go through this, I think that's what we're looking for is that kind of information. If you guys really feel like there is a better solution, we'd at least need to, to have that brought to us so we can discuss it and decide what, what direction we can, can move. I will just add that all of the advice we've got from two different groups, both Train and, and uh, Aquaphase, which is the company who's treating our water, both tell us they think in the long run we can clean up the insides of these pipes. And, and we do know that it is the problem inside the pipes that's causing, the, okay. causing this. So, you know, if they said, I don't think you'll be able to clean these up, we'd come back and say we're going to have to repipe the whole building. But they still continue to tell us they think we can clean up the inside of the pipe. So that's so so we think. And actually, I probably should let Mr. Hall speak. This is much more an area of his expertise than is mine. He's worked in this environment, and not just HVAC, but in what you used to do in oil fields, oil fields where they were doing this kind of stuff. But um, you know, it, it is a matter of we've got to get this cleaned up, and when we get it cleaned up. We'll get it fixed and then get it cleaned up and, and stay cleaned up. And we, you know, this situation is not unique to, uh, to Kalioka. We have this situation in other places. We've got two units at the end of the B Hall at Spring Hill High School, where, if you, where the ROTC room is, which is the exact same problem. And we've just put a filter on at Spring Hill High School to start to clean that up as well. And, uh, and so we, you know, we, we've got these, but we put this water treatment program in all of our schools now. It's in all of our facilities. If I'm not, we, we do still have a motion out, correct? Okay, just making sure. Uh, do I need to restate that motion or is everybody okay with where we're at on that? Any, any further discussion on that? We motion? just have a question for the notes over here. I gotta keep up. Okay. Did, did, did we just change the motion or was it amended? Did, did you just did you just go back and change your motion, Mr. Dudley? Just change the motion. Okay, so with the motion and the original motion in seconds, what we're working off of. We had a motion and a second, right? Yes. Yes. Is that correct? We amended that motion to include the So, so are you voting on an amendment or a motion? That's what I'm trying okay. to understand over here for the notes. Right. The, uh, okay. uh, the original person who made the motion, Mr. Dudley, and the motion is as this. It's items um, eight, I'm sorry, seven and eight, as stated on there, which totaled 67000 $549 for those two uh, bids. Uh, and to, in addition to that, to open a PO with train for some of the other repairs as discussed at um, Kalioka uh, for a total of $32,451. Okay. 
let, let me just clarify. I think I think those those repairs would be system wide as needed, right? Is that correct? And it's not, not just limited to a school. Just, is it limited to Kalioka? That's what we've been doing. Is just using that money system system wide. Port says they were out of money, and I didn't want them shut down yeah. because we didn't. Mr. Dudley is then saying I was incorrect when I stated it is a system wide PO. Then okay, and who and who seconded it just to make sure that we were clear on Mr. that? Mr. Beaver did. Mr. Beaver, okay, thank you. Just want to make sure we have the notes. Oh, I correct. appreciate that. Thank you. Everybody on board with that. Okay. Uh, if there's no other discussion on that, then uh, all in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that does pass. Thank you. I still have questions, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Mr. Lassiter. All right, so I'm still not comfortable yet with with Hampshire as far as what you know we've discussed. So you say you're waiting on us to make a decision. I guess we need to look at them and say, you know, where, what direction do you want to point us in? Which I'm pretty sure I know what that is, but um, I would assume that's something we probably need to talk about now. Is it not? If we're going to get it done this summer, yes, sir. And I think what they've told us, and this is our position, you know, as Mr. Tyne shared, we have we have all that refrigerant sitting in our maintenance shop in in containers. Uh, we're going to, when it comes time to make the switch over, we're going to load it back in that comp uh, that uh, um, chiller. And we're going to fire up that new compressor, and as long as it works, I mean, we'll do whatever we've got to do to babysit it and keep it working. But if it dies, we will then have to either decide, are we going to replace that chiller and invest what could be $150,000, I'm just guessing, in a system that really the whole system probably needs to be replaced, you know, because, or, you know, do you put, do you put, you know, keep that 57 Chevy going and stick a, you know, stick a new uh, carburetor on it. I don't know what, what's the analogy. I don't know. That's way past me. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, whatever it is. Um, and we can, you come back and ask if you want to do that. We could, we even talked about at one point renting a chiller. And then we, I think that's several thousand dollars a month. You know, you'd want to do that. But we would have to do something to keep going because if it dies in May 15th, we can't have a new system in May 16th. Um, so, I mean, it's just at that point, unless we repl we go ahead and just bite the bullet and replace the whole system, we're, we're probably going to be fighting this battle for a long time. But if we're going to replace the system, as you heard him said, they, they can't do that in 30 days. I mean, they've got to have time to repair. Uh, I think, I, and I'll just add to Mr. Moore's comment about the assessment. I, the assessment will have things prioritized based on what we've seen already, and we're not through looking at all the things on the assessment. This will probably be pretty close to the top of the list. I mean, it won't, I can't promise you'll be first, but it's going to be pretty high on the list. And I, I guess what my feelings on this are, there's a pretty good chance that when we go to start it back up this school year, it's going to go. But I'm worried about when we start next school year in the middle of summer, if this thing fails now, now we're in a, in a world of hurt. Cause I think, didn't you guys say before there's even a lead time on renting one of these, you know, and getting that, I mean, it's not like if it died, the first day of school, the next day, we're going to have a cool school, right? Probably not the next day. I'd say if they're available, we probably could get something in the three to four day evident. If they're available. If they're available. And I mean, I, I guess that's my point to this is, yes, I realize that, that you know, we're doing, we're going to look at the assessment you feel pretty comfortable. This is going to come up pretty high in the assessment. Obviously, if the second day of school, we lose a chiller, or even if we go to start it up and we lose it, it'll probably go to the top of the list. And I mean, I'm wondering if, if we shouldn't at least, you know, look at what we're going to have to do and, and have them, if we're going to change it out over the summer, you know, like you said, we're going to have to be, they need direction to go very shortly. And 
you know, we've got, let's see, well, if we turn it on, I don't remember. When do we turn it? When do we turn our chillers on? It'll be maybe usually about mid April, April right. first, second week of April. Just depends on what the weather does. As soon as it starts warming up, and then we normally run that through almost uh, November first, yeah, maybe say about Thanksgiving. You know, a little. Okay. Yeah. This year, this year we didn't turn them on until Thanksgiving because we had a unusually warm fall. Right. And I mean, I'm just not sure. I'm not sure we want to gamble that, and then take the risk of having to rent and you know, if we rent a chiller and then we still turn around and, and we replace the system, now we've just thrown rental money away. Uh, I mean, I, I guess that I'm kind of torn here as to which way we should go and looking for some, <laughs> looking for some, some guidance and, you know, the feel good effect here. So <laughs> I, I've, Open for suggestions. Thank you. Well, I agree with Mr. Laster, and, and, and the problem we're having is getting all of our crystal balls lined up in in, in a row. Uh, you know, the assessment is going to have affect our actions there greatly. Uh, all the other unknowns is going to affect, but but we definitely had to provide an environment where the, the kids have heating and cooling uh, and then staff. Uh, you know, I don't, <clears throat> don't want to be like the schools in Detroit where, where they just, everything is shut off and then it is just non-productive learning environment. And then so any thoughts that we can do and any plans that, that we can keep things going, uh, you know, I, I don't know if we need to to go ahead and start addressing uh, if we decide to to do the the million dollar upgrade or whatever about thinking of where those funds are coming from and doing they go ahead and, and tell the commission hey it's high possibility that we're going to need need funds either from you or, or to draw from from our fund balance or, or whatever, but. To, to give some warnings that that hey Hampshire Hampshire system is on its last leg, and then so you know I just uh, whatever we have to do to keep things going. If you don't mind, uh, Stan, I know we've had some discussion. This is kind of jumping ahead, uh, um, and, and in talking with you, I know the assessment is coming up, and I think we've got roughly. You're thinking that we should be able as a board to have some discussions on that in in. Mid March, I think, is what we're looking at right now. Um, yeah, and, that, and then that, that would still leave us. To be made to you. Okay, and then we still have some time before the end of March for the full board meeting to be able to do that. Based on that kind of timeline, having if you were to have a green light from us by the end of March, for example, on on this project or whatever on this project, let's just keep it at that. Is that enough time for you guys to do what you need to do? And that would be the green light from us, understanding that we've got to figure out. Uh, funding on that, which would, uh, again, we'd still have to do, have some more discussions on that. Um, and that may mean coming from the county commission again, uh, if we have to request fund balance. That would be on the outside edge, but yes, I think we can get it with a, a time frame. Okay. Mr. Pennington. Well, we've known that Hampshire was failing for the last six months. Uh, and if you're gonna, if we make the decision, the board meeting in March, won't go before the county commission until April if we take it out of fund balance. Now you're probably talking the 1st of May before you can get started. Well, I, I doubt if I wait till May, I can get it engineered and equipment ordered and start in May. Mr. Lester. On the, the list that you've seen so far from the assessment, are there any other HVAC needs that that we think we would need to do that are close to this dollar amount? The uh, Actually, the assessment is lined up very much in line with what Train had already provided. I don't know if you remember when Train came back with their original proposal, um, original audit, there, they identified $17 million worth of needed HVAC repairs. Uh, 
there were a certain number of those that would fund under the performance contract that we could pay back with the savings over 15 years. There were another group that didn't. And out of that group, we prioritized what we had experienced the most problems with. And, and Hampshire was on that list. Whitthorn was on that list. And that all went to the county commission. And the county commission chose to fund the replacement of Whitthorn. And we didn't do anything else with the list. So that's why we came back to you with um, – the amount that uh, the Whitthorn, I mean the Hampshire thing in the fall. In addition, kind of the, the next thing that's been our trouble spot as a district would be the units uh, at Mount Pleasant Middle School where we've got a, a system that part of the school has got some classroom units that seem to be working fine. That school is about 15 years old, 16 years old. We've got the other section is rooftop units with a VAV system. That I don't know that I can even explain, but it control where you spreads the air out in different areas. And we've had pro a lot of problems with that. Now, issues have to do with some controls that were put in failed. They may be somewhat related to some maintenance of that. But we asked, Train originally recommended a retro commissioning, go back and just clean out and refurbish, tighten belts. And, and we asked them, just go take a look at that one more time for us. And they've come back and said, and I think you find that in your packet, that they would recommend replacing that part of that system, and that's 900 and something thousand dollars. We've not seen anything else on the assessment that's any more, that's any different from that. Now, we've seen some other things. The assessment does look at condition, but the assessment is going to be based on, here's what we recommend you replace based on expected failure. And expected failure is going to be on life expectancy. So, for instance, they've gone into some of our schools like Riverside Elementary and Spring Hill Elementary, which were built in 1984, and said by the industry tables, all of that HVAC equipment has exceeded its expected life. You can keep operating, because we're operating in both those schools. We have problems here or there. But eventually, that stuff's all going to die. Do you want to wait till it dies? Or do you need to go ahead and replace it? Because we've operated in a fix on failure environment. We just wait till it fails and then we fix it. The assessment is more going to be based on here's when it should be fixed so you don't wait till it dies to fix it. And so that's, so those two schools, for instance, they've, they, the assessment includes a complete replacement of the entire HVC systems in those two schools because they've exceeded their life expectancy. In, in like Mount Pleasant Middle, if you're talking about around the choir room and things like that, that's those were horrible prior to 2010. Yeah, yeah they. I mean, they've been bad that probably since the school was built. So, yeah, it is I, that. I mean, way. and it's hard to imagine how bad it is unless you're there. But my, the reason I ask that question is, if we think that there are more than one project that. You know, we need to spend close to the same amount of money on. Could we not go to the commission and say, you know, we have several HVAC issues that are high dollar. Now, we want to fix one or the other, but, you know, we're leaning towards one, but we don't, we got to have, make sure we have all the information. That way we could, we, because if we know we're going to do one or the other, then we could actually have the funding set up and, and go through that and be ready to go when when we decide, you know, when we give the okay and they give us all the information. Because like I said, I hate to see us the very first of August get hit. And I mean, we know what a strain that, that August and even September can be on these units. And there's nothing like having angry parents and angry teachers because their building is extremely hot. Mr. Breeden, you said that looking at mid-March for this audit to come back, it, are you close enough to having a firm date yet? Uh, actually, I, I spoke with Chairman Moore about that this evening because I think the hopes was that they would come back and have a special call meeting and he's and, and they are available the week of March the what's the month uh, there's a couple of days they yeah March the 17th was a day we'd thrown out we were just trying to make sure that was going to work for everybody's schedule that's the date they had told us they could come and do that it would be March Thursday night March the 17th um, I think Mr. Moore was trying to make sure everybody that was going to fit everybody else's calendar even 
to extent that you could invite, you know, other government officials to come and hear that report if you wanted to. Along those lines, and it sounds like you guys are already working on it, but um, it sounds like we're going to have to devote a lot of time to this audit. And not only devote a lot of time, we have some serious questions we have to answer when this comes up. Uh, anybody can read into that all they want to. But when this audit's presented to us, uh, you know, I have no idea if there's, if they drop this thing on us and there's $35 million of immediate needs, we're going to have some difficult questions to answer. Uh, and, you know, we might want to take March the 17th as a work session, and then we may need a follow-up meeting. And I, when I say work session, we might, we, we probably better order dinner that night. And then the next week, we might order, order dinner again because we may be here a while. Um, because it, for now, I'll just leave it at, we may have some very difficult questions that we got to answer. And uh, we may not be very popular at some point, but um, as I said a while ago, talking about the, the other issues, it, um, we can't look backwards. We, we all chose to sit in the seats that we sit in, and the uh, only thing we can do is make the best decisions moving forward. So, uh, but I'm glad you guys are talking about that, and uh, we have fun times ahead, I think. Yeah, and I think that is the, that's kind of the direction we're looking at going is having some really good discussions on that. Um, and I understand Mr. Laster's concerns about one, not wanting to wait too long to do this, but uh, the other side of it is I guess my concerns are putting that ahead of when we're so close to, to really having a document where we can really weigh this. Um, and I think it's obvious this is something is, is definitely a need, but we're so close to having that opportunity to really weigh this against all of the other needs and decide how big this need issue really is and uh, in the scope of the whole thing. Um, and, I th and I think from what I'm hearing, that timeline is still gives us, I mean, I know it's close, but I think that still keeps us within the timeline being able to get things done on this, um, or at least gets us close. Mr. Bates. And, and I think, Mr. Lindsay, I think you uh, uh, may hit the uh, uh, nail right on the head that there there are going to be a lot of things that we're going to have to discuss when we get that assessment and I'm hoping that uh, the director and his office is going to be prepared to be able to give us some guidance on that because I think we're going to get the to-do list and it may be a long to-do list and so uh, our committee and ultimately the board is going to have to take a look at that list and I think the first question is going to be uh, what part of that list are we going to go ahead and try to make a down payment on you know, if we have available funding, what what do we want to go ahead and start immediately, day one? And then there's going to be uh, probably some more things left on that list, even after we make that decision. And then we're going to have to decide, are we going to try to uh, nibble at that list over several years? Or are we going to try to fast track this and try to do this in two or three years? We're going to have to have some logistic type information from central office as to even if we, in an ideal world, we wanted to fix everything overnight, it may take several months just to uh, to do that. So there may be some, uh, do they have the manpower to be able to, to handle all that at once? So we're going to, have to get some guidance on that. And then we're also going to have to get some guidance from the director as well as to other, other needs. Uh, if there's any uh, academic needs that we need to be taking a look at um, that, um, is going to make it difficult for us to put as big of a down payment as maybe we might want to. We need to, I think, have that information as well. But I think this will be good for us as a board to be able to we get everything out on the table, look at everything all at the same time. We're going to know exactly what type of available funding that we're going to have, and then we then be able to give some guidance to the central office as to how fast we want to try to fast track that. And then we have another body that is uh, – uh, we, they're going to be able to give their input as well, and that we hope that maybe we can have a lot of commissioners there to be able to hear that information because they're going to have to make some decisions as well. Of We may not be able to take everything out uh, with our available funding. Uh, if we're going to try to do that over a certain timeline, we're going to have to 
have some partnerships to be able to do that. And so that's that's part of the discussions as well. So I think it will be a very, um, I think it'll be a very constructive um, discussion. And we're, and I think it's us doing our due diligence that we're getting the information. Instead of us just thinking about the money, we're gonna be thinking about the needs first and then we can, everything else will, uh, we'll just have to try to make the best decisions possible. Okay. Uh, any more discussion on the train? I appreciate that, John. Um, I know we've got three other items here, the project cost report, capital improvements, uh, in both athletics and education. I don't think there's – are there any changes to that, or is that just informational, again, as, as what we've been looking at? Any board members have any questions about that, or can we go ahead and move on past that? Okay, I don't see anything there. Uh, we did have item uh, five here, general discussion of, of calculation of architect fees. Uh, Jake, is there something you want to speak to on that? or? Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Jake on that or any questions on that issue? Okay. If not, we did have another item here, um, options for selecting an architect for future projects. Um, I know there was a, but maybe some sand, if you could just briefly, and we can go from there. Uh, in, in your packet, you'll see a brief memo from me. Uh, Chairman Moore had asked for us to do some investigation about, you know, wh what were the opportunities that we have to uh, – in using an architect. Um, I'm just, excuse me, Dr. Marzak just sent me a text, so I'm trying to, to see this because I wanted to make sure, he said if, if I video in, can you let them know I want to talk, hit the button. So if he video, I can't see him, you all can. So if he videos in, he wants to talk. <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed, I was busy. Uh, Thanks, Dan. <laughs> okay. He was with us briefly and gave us a thumbs up and left. Okay, I, I'm not much of a multitasker, so you all were talking and he texted me and I missed the text, I guess. He texted 8.32, what time is it now? 8.33? Oh. Yeah, so, yeah, we're good. He's ready for me to keep going. That's what he said. But just let you all know, if he comes up there, he's coming in. Um, on the uh, architect, so what we did is we talked to some other school districts. Also uh, talked to Mr. Wolliver to get to make sure legally what we needed to do with the school system as hiring an architect. Some of the other districts we talk to, we've talked to districts who do it all kinds of ways. Some districts do it like we do, where they hire an architect for all services. Um, and so basically we have an architect and anything we do that is design work should go through that, art. that's who you have there for that. Others use an architect for just building, new building projects or major renovations and then they have some consulting engineering firms they use for like the roof replacements for instance. Uh, one, one school district, they have a roofing consulting firm that helps them put together all their roof bids and, and does the design, and puts, they don't use their architect for that. Uh, another one who does HVAC, mechanical, well, uh, MP&E, mechanical plumbing and electrical. Their consulting engineering firm helps them bid out all that stuff. That's kind of what we've been doing with TRAIN, and actually we've had further conversations. TRAIN actually can serve as our mechanical consultant. Uh, on Central High School, they wrote the specifications for the equipment. Now, they would have, we could have talked to them about pricing out for us doing the mechanical design, but SSOE said, no, that's in our contract. We provide mechanical design. We're not gonna let anybody. I even asked the question, could we get, and they said, no, we don't let anybody else design it. We do all design work because that's our contract. Obviously, they would have lost a portion of the contract if they did that. So we can, use, we, can, we can use consultants to do those kind of things. And then, uh, you know, the other thing that, that some school districts do is they go out and hire an architect if they're going to build a school. They hire one. They're on a specific project basis. 
And I know uh, talking with Mr. Hewlett, they've been working with another school district who just did that, that, that's getting ready to build a new school. And I think they were involved in helping them select the architect and walk around and look at different schools. So they may have some input as well. But, but I think what Mr. Wolver shared, and he can speak to that, kind of support that we have the option of doing some of those different things within TCA and, and still uh, you know, meeting the requirements. There are some requirements. It's professional services, so there's, I don't think we actually have to bid it out, but there are some limitations. There, there is some uh, things that we, guidelines we have to follow in selecting those, even though it's professional services. I appreciate that. And again, that was, you know, we talk, started talking about this a couple of meetings ago, and that was really the, I wanted us to explore what our options were, um, realizing that we had always been under this model, as I think as far as everyone that's, that's on the board is experienced. And I just wanted us to look at some different ways. And I thank you, Jake, and, and thank you, Stan, for kind of exploring that we kind of have a lot of options, it looks like. Uh, there's several different models we can go with. Um, and I know with the current contract that'll be up in June, the, the other part of this was I didn't want to get to the point where we're, as a board feel like we're right up on that contract and we have to make a rush decision. I know we started this a little early and that was intentional so that we could have some more time to look at some of these options. And, and again, if, if we as a board decide we want to stick with the, um, not only the same model we have, but the same company we have and just continue with what we're doing, that's, that's our decision. I just wanted us to have time to really look at these different options. I know one of the concerns that I had of not having someone kind of full time was when these small, things come up. For example, the the sinkhole issue that we ran into. Um, and maybe you guys give some direction on that. How would that be handled if we didn't have somebody just kind of on call for that kind of stuff? Well, or maybe be sinkhole's my, not the best one. Maybe uh, 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 I think sinkhole's a great one. Okay. I mean, we, we would probably look to establish a, a relationship with a structural engineering firm, just like a mechanical engineering firm, that we would use for those kind of things. And we would... Uh, you know, there'd be some some process where you gave us, you know, authorization to bring you back, recommending, and, and we kind of, again, not keep them on. We wouldn't be paying them, but we would just say this is who we normally go to when we okay. have a structural uh, structural engineering problem, and, and that would or a you, geotechnical engineering and problem. And that would give or, you as a department, I guess, some, once we flesh that out, to have maybe a, a certain maybe somebody like Train that we know we go to for these issues, and somebody some other group that we know that we feel like is really take care of us on those issues, and and depending on what comes up, we would address it that way. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Lindsey? A couple of questions. Uh, first one, um, there, there's, and this may be a, a question for you, Mr. Wilbur, but is, is there no threshold that once we exceed that as far as money-wise or that we have to have architectural drawings involved? Uh, So, it, it, and I'm throwing hypotheticals out, and I guess, I don't know, may, I may already have the answer to my question, but if if we have a $75,000 repair to an HVAC system, would that require architect involvement? Not necessarily if you're replacing the same system and it doesn't involve a lot of changes. Uh, that, that's probably going to be more of a case-by-case -case analysis not always. I mean, the, the answer is there may be some situations where you're replacing a unit with a like-kind unit and you don't have to have that. Uh, there may be other situations under 50,000 where it involves uh, structural integrity that, that you might have to have somebody stamp drawing on for you. Right. My next question, if Dr. Marzak can hear me, if you would video in, it, this question is for you. But.
I'm going to call him. While, while we're waiting for him, let me just share one thing that that uh, I was just talking with John here because he, he John's project manager for train, so he's putting in a lot of these things where they're using. He said if you're changing the design intent, then you have to have new drawings. Of course, with Whitthorn Middle School, there were drawings. Yeah, so and they were stamped by a train engineer that they used. So I mean, it's it's my understanding it's our, it's an engineer or an architect. There are certain drawings stamped by an engineer. So we had drawings. I mean, they were provided. We didn't use our architect to do them, but we had drawings that were provided by train. And I get, and the reason I asked that is I guess the piggyback of Mr. Moore's question. Um, I, I don't think it, it's pretty obvious. I don't like doing things just because we always done them that way. But I also don't want to delay something just because we change to another mode of transportation, I guess. You know, if it if it's beneficial, and this is a question that I was going to ask Dr. Marzak, and I'll ask you, he may defer this to you anyways, but what do you want to do? I mean, what, it, it, if, if this was, you're there. There he is. Go ahead, what's your question, Mike? All right, my question is, what do you guys want to do architect-wise? What, um, in the ideal world, how do you want to conduct business moving forward? Concerning, um, and I believe in what you're talking about is concerning about um, what we want our buildings to look like in the future. Well, not, no, not necessarily. My question is um, the delivery system from the architect. Do you want to have someone on retainer as we have uh, now? Or would you rather go on a case-by-case -case basis? Or, or how would you prefer to to do business? Well, I, I think considering what we know is coming down the pike over the next couple of years, considering the growth that we're going to have, um, and, and as more families move to Murray County, I believe having somebody on retainer will be really beneficial because they'll get to know us, we'll get to know them, and our decisions will be more streamlined moving forward in the future versus working with this person this time and then maybe this next person this next time. And so that, that process to getting that, that architect is going to be really crucial to make sure that we have a partner moving forward. And, and I guess another question to go along with that, I guess the way our contract's set up with SSOE now is that pretty much every, they get everything. But would it be more beneficial if we included in that contract that we're, we're only going to turn this work over to you if it exceeds a certain limit? You know, if it is a, um, you know, I don't know, if, if it's a, well, I, I'll just use an item we have before us. If it's a block building that's a bathroom and a concession stand, can we go? Can we deliver that in a different way, a, a more efficient way for us, rather than turning that over to an architect on retainer? Maybe we only want to hand work to them that exceeds a half million dollars, and I'm throwing numbers out, and there's no reason for them, but uh, is that a possibility? Is, is that more what you're, you're wanting a partnership as we move forward with renovations and construction, it sounds like. Am I putting words in your mouth? Yeah, no, that's, that's, yeah, that's what we're talking, that's what I'm talking about, and that's what Stan and I have talked about, too, moving forward. And I'll just add uh, to what Dr. Marzak's saying that that I think what we would start with is is we would do a request for qualifications where we we found, you know, if we were choosing somebody, folks that met the qualifications of what we want to do because not every, and, and I know Dr. Marzak is very interested in us looking forward with the construction of our schools and we've even, you know, we're arranging to look at some more 21st century type schools. But also as another part of that, one of the limitations, and again, I think our current situation, not to try to, to degrade our current situation, but our current situation because we've said that they do everything and they're an all-stop shop that sometimes we lose some input and control. And, and what we would like to do is have a mechanical firm who we could use, like I'll just use the name. Talk to Williamson County Schools. They've got an architectural firm they use, but they have an MP&E consultant who does all of their remodel work or replacement work, but they also are the ones that they insist design the MP&E systems 
for their new school. So they, they don't use, their architect doesn't get to pick who the mp and &E engineer is. They use this mp and &E engineer that they consult with. And what happens is you get more consistent mechanical systems throughout all your schools instead of whatever the flavor of the month is. And one of the things we just ran into, and, and I just lay this out, the keys, the kinks. We built Spring Hill Middle School a few years ago. We worked with them to design a key system in a certain keyway. When we got into the central project, they're using a different keyway. They didn't, I would have thought they would have kept the same one. So we've stepped in and said, time out. We want to, we want, I mean, we didn't find out till kind of the thing had already been bid. Fortunately, uh, Hill Spencer and Bell has helped us work with the, the vendor who's supplying the doors and we've got back, we're moving back because we're trying to put in a standard keying system for the entire district. Well, we don't want uh, Stanley Best keys in, in this uh, key building and the Falcon Keyway in this building, which is what we were going to end up with because we end up, what we have now is the set of keys to get in all our schools is about that big around. I got a set out there in the car if you want to see them. That will get you in the door and then won't get you inside all the doors when you get inside the building. So we're, you know, but we'd like to, we'd like to, and we've found now an architectural consultant for keys who's going to work with us and help us do that. So we'd like to be able to develop those kind of relationships. But again, I, I think Dr. Marzak's right to find that main architect firm who could work with that flexibility within that setup, who knows what kind of schools we're building and help us move forward in the future is, is the right direction. Mr. To kind of go a little further on the central as far as the train thing, you know, when we talk about SSOE and train and, and using trains documents, is my understanding that not only did you guys, not only did train do the documents, but then SSOE marked the price up to get their chunk out of it too. Is that is that correct? Train didn't actually do the documents. They wouldn't let them do the drawings. They just let them write the specifications. Okay. So they provided the specifications, but we didn't get any savings for them providing the specifications. So SSOE got that part done for free. And while in the time that I was not on the board, I think you guys did a great job of deciding finally that we do need a project management group. And one of the thing, one of the avenues I would like to investigate is if you're going to continue to have a, a project management group, we just saw today what happens when, when they, you know, things don't mesh too well. And, you know, if I, I, I would like to see for our project management group where their normal template is, they, you know, they help work real close with the architect and the architect is under them or if it was for example let's say it was trained doing the mp and e that train would fall under them i would like to for us to look at some examples and since hewlett spencer is our current project managing group i'd like not not, not tonight but i would like to hear uh, a scenario from them that Hey, if we if we keep them as our project management group, how would they help us find architects they are comfortable with working with and that are comfortable with working with them? And how would we handle the larger scale, the smaller scale, you know, the immediate, oops, something just happened tonight, we gotta do something now. And I would I would like to hear that because if we're gonna keep a project management group, we need somebody that can work together. And Personally, as far as I'm ready for a change, I, as far as architects and engineers go, I'm ready for a change. You know, nine and a half years, and it's time to do something different. So, you know, I, I hope that that we do go through and look and see, you know, different options. What happens? Those are again good questions asked. What happens if if this ha if this goes out? What if we get a sinkhole? And so hopefully we'll investigate that and make our decision. Mr. Bennett. Well, just so you don't get the wrong idea, I'm, I'm happy with what you do, but just because you get along with the person we hire now, you may not get along with the person on the next project. You never know that. Uh, for Mr. Wooliver, uh, with the, the contract we have with SSOE, we've had problems ever since I've been on the board. 
you can write various things in the contract to cover situations like we're talking about this evening, can't you? I think it's important, like Dr. Marzak said, that we have an architectural firm. And what is it, Jerry, four years ago that we had uh, all the people come and give us a presentation about five or six companies? And I'm not saying five or six companies, but I think it's important to put out a, a letter saying we're looking for a new architectural firm and listening to the people and seeing what they have to say. Along those lines, I, I guess where I'm, I, I'm seeing is one thing I'm uncomfortable with is, is our current contract is kind of a catch-all. I mean, they literally get everything. And, and I, I like, as a in my place on the board, I like having some more options than that. And I really like what we're talking about, about having uh, under different specialties, having some relationships there um, that we know we can turn to that are experts in that. And, and to be honest, what you brought up about maybe having one um, one firm that is in charge of mechanical, and they know our, for example, just for example, since Train's been dealing with us, they know what's going on in all of our schools. And being able to have somebody that really has a, a working knowledge of everything that's going on with that aspect of our schools, I think is very, uh, very nice to have. Uh, but on top of that, again, we got back to the project management too. Um, um, I would rather look at us, because again, I, I, if we were to move forward with project management as the arrangement we have now, um, I know for a fact that I want to move forward with having the architect under that umbrella, which is what was recommended to us with, with what they normally do. And I think other firms kind of said the same thing as well. And I, I think, in my opinion, I want to go that direction. So uh, when it comes to any new facilities or new schools like that, if we're anything under that project management umbrella, I would like to see that all of it fall under that and let them handle all of it. Oh, Director, did you have something to say? been doing his due diligence with uh, what we need to do as a county moving forward in the 21st century uh, to make sure that we've got growth quality um, facilities moving forward. So, so we've had some really good conversations about what he's discovered, and I'm feeling really good about where we're going. Um, so, um, so I think that I, I think that can pretty much sum up my perspective and, and where we're coming from. Uh, we're on a good playing field, and I think we've got a good guy at the helm that's taking us there. Mr. Lindsay, I, I, I kind of hesitate to ask this, but I'll just ask it. But um, it, it appears from what Stan, you and Dr. Marzak both said that it, it's very important to you guys to have the right architect to get the right type building that you guys envision moving forward. Um, but as far as the, the renovation side or repair side, those those things that we need someone for. And, 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 and I'm making an assumption just by what some of you guys have said tonight, but it, it appears to me that we, for now, are happy with the delivery method that Hewlett Spencer has used. And we're, we're happy with the value that they bring to us. Mr. Wolver, is it is it even legal? And is my question to say that could we enter into a contract where they would just oversee for a certain period of time that Hewlett Spencer would oversee? And I'm saying this, and you guys may say, "Heck, no, you don't want any part of it." But but they would oversee these. Um, I'll go back the the bathroom. If 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 we set something up and said, "All right, we're going to hire." Uh, moving forward, we're going to hire an architect on a case-by-case -case basis for uh, new construction and for major renovations. And we define major renovations as anything over a half million dollars. But those other those other projects that we have, is it even legal for us to enter in a contract with a project manager such as Hewlett Spencer to say, you know, every project we have from that twenty five from that fifty thousand dollar threshold to that five hundred thousand dollar threshold is yours. And they take care of everything. They take care of the design of it, they take care of the project management side of it. Is, is that even legal to do? Yeah, I don't see why not. I mean that's essentially what you have on a larger scale with SSOE. I mean not only do they provide architectural services, but they provide mechanical engineering, structural engineering. So yeah, I I mean I'd want to research it a little bit more fully if that's the direction the board wants to go, but as we sit here, I don't see why you couldn't. 
and I just throw that out there maybe as maybe another option uh, because uh, again I, I think all of us looking at what Hewlett Spencer has done so far and um, they they'll, they'll say that it is because of them but maybe it's the delivery method that the value is in so if they can save us a half million dollars on the floor coverings at Central High School after being on the job for a month, how much more could they save us over a 10-year period when we're doing uh, these smaller jobs? How much money can they save, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know, uh, fixing the crack in the, in the wall of the gym at Kalioka that cost, what, $180,000? Maybe they could have saved $20,000 out of that. You know, I, and, and I'm saying them, and I'm, maybe I shouldn't, but maybe I should just say that delivery method. Would would it be beneficial for us to have that delivery method on retainer rather than just having an architectural service? I don't know. I'm just throwing it out. You know, I, I think that, that, you know, what we need to do is to know that just like when we talked with Hewlett Spencer about the contract for Central High School, is that it's our contract to do with as we choose. And we can build this thing any way that we want to. And when you start talking retainers, that means you're paying somebody monthly fees whether they do anything or not. So we probably want to define our terms a little bit better. But we need to understand that whomever we employ in this thing, if it's a, another SSOE of types or if it's a mechanical contractor that does something, if it's trained, they're all going to want to be paid. You know, so we may be paying 5% now, but if we get four or five individuals, we may wind up paying 8 or 10%. So we need to be sh sure where we're going. And I might suggest that each individual put on paper what they would like to see and then give it to Stan and let him come up with something with Mr. Williver's uh, um, input to see what is legal and what parameters we have there and if we can actually build something that would please everyone. You know, we, we can talk about what we'd like and, and you know, if the, Mr. Hewlett, Mr. Spencer, or Mr. Bragatsi would like to be involved with that, I'm sure they'd bid on it. But, you know, I think that we have to have a plan. You know, we can't go to bid something and just say, give us what you want to give us. We, we need to tell them exactly what we want. And I, and I think that's where we need to really, really start looking. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Morrison. And I, I, I think that was the direction I was going to look at going. Stan, moving forward from this, I know you've gotten some input, and I think it's uh, there's been a couple of different things that we've talked about, and I, I think you got an idea there. Um, and, I, and I would like to request that any other board members have any anything they want to submit to Stan to kind of get some direction maybe for next month, and we, maybe we can continue this discussion, narrowing it, I guess, a little further. Because it does sound like maybe we, we, we're not happy with the model we have now, and we want to look at some other models, be it a split model, be it a... Uh, working with the project manager on all of it or maybe some other hybrid between there. It sounds like that's kind of the direction we're looking at. Um, and I would encourage other board members to, again, uh, if you have anything else, you maybe get it in writing. And I, I plan to do that myself and get that to stand of what I'm envisioning of something. Uh, and, and then he can run that by our, our legal counsel and the director as well. I definitely want his input on, on what he, what you guys have already been discussing on what you want to move forward with. Uh, and maybe you can bring some, some narrowed down discussion back to us next month. And, and we can continue this. Um, again, that's that's the nice thing about talking about this early. We're not we're not under a crunch to do it tonight, Mr. Bates. And I'll expand on that just a little bit. I would ask that you know we uh, look around at other districts. And I think you've already done this, Mr. Breeden, but you know to get their input uh, for maybe they've been there, done that, and uh, maybe we can uh, steal some ideas from from other districts where they have adopted a model and been very successful and very happy with that. I think that would be uh, useful information as well. Okay, um, that was item six. There, uh, we will go ahead and move on uh, past that. We've got we had already taken care of items um, seven and eight. Um, item nine was ground maintenance contract. This just is an just FYI. Uh, an FYI, okay. but we will have this back to you. We are making plans now to bring this back to you next month, getting ready to release bids. We, uh, two years ago, we rebid our grass mowing. Currently, what we do is we contract out our grass mowing for all of our facilities, with exception of the athletic fields. The athletic fields are the responsibility of the schools, 
normally handled by coaches and such because they require specialized care. But the rest of our grass, and really that's all it is, it's a grass mowing contract. They, they mow the grass, blow off the sidewalks, uh, do treat cracks with uh, the herbicide, you know, get that kind of stuff. Um, like I said, two years ago, we rebid that. We've had a company called Jed's Lawn Care that's done a fabulous job for us. Uh, prior to that, we were struggling to keep the large mow. Jed's actually did our district and a couple others, and they would come in and mow all of our schools in three days. He had large equipment. Well, Jed contacted us a couple of weeks ago and said, just want you all to know I'm closing the business and I won't be able to continue my contract with you. So we're extremely disappointed. Uh, however, we understand it's we're about uh, right now 45 days away from starting mowing grass. So we're because we normally start around April the first. So we're putting it back out for bids. We're going to do like we did last time. Last time we bid it into four zones in case that we wanted to choose multiple. And because of the reason for that is prior to Jed's, we were using one contractor who we were his only job. And it took him out, we were, if, if we were at that time mowing every two weeks, and it took his crew two weeks to get everything mowed, and then they'd start all over again, and when it rained, they'd get behind. And then they couldn't catch back up, because it, and so we realized, unless it's a company big enough to really handle it, we may want to break it up into month. So we're going to bid it in zone again with the option of either selecting one contractor or multiple contractors, and we'll get those bids and bring those back to you in March. Okay. And I would assume that as you're moving ahead with that model again, you, you guys are fine with that model, and that's... At, at this point, yeah. Okay. Because it's worked so well under this arrangement now, you know, uh, even one of the things we even had this discussion, I think most of you are aware that we're working right now, Dr. Marzak had re recommend this uh, company, Lean Frog, who's, uh, who looks at our organizational efficiency, that we've talked with them some about our maintenance and ground maintenance and custodial and he I explained the model and he said that's you know what you're doing now is much cheaper than you could do it in-house okay. he said if you tried to bring this in-house manage it and of course you know prior to we starting this we used to make it the responsibility of each school each school was just responsible for mowing their own grass back when we had custodians and they were given a certain amount of money so so I think this uh, is a much better the one the one caveat is we had a locked-in price for the rest of the remaining budget year. That's what we budgeted on. This may come back higher, and it may impact our budget for the remainder of the year. Because we, so we'll just let you know when we get the bids in. Okay. Thank you. Any board members have any discussion on that? If not, we'll go ahead and move ahead to the uh, proposed ADA sidewalk at Marvin Wright, item ten. Just and again, an FYI. Anything? It's an FYI. The. Uh, Development across the street, putting sidewalks in. The city engineer from Spring Hill met with Mr. Hall and me up there to show us they're going to cut a, a a a ramp into our sidewalk just to make it ADCA okay. accessible and free of charge. They're going to schedule it so it doesn't interrupt school traffic. Okay. Schedule it during a break. If no discussion on that, the next time at 11, it was just, again, another uh, what we just started including. We'll see that every month. Does anyone have any questions on the SRO activity report? If not, we're down to the last item. Oh, Mr. Bates. Before we adjourn, I just want to officially announce we I was asked to uh, have a special call meeting following the committee meeting, but looks like there's no recommendation from the committee. The committee has uh, deferred that, so I'm officially canceling that meeting. I don't want us to have to convene a meeting just to cancel it, so thank you. All right. Any other discussion? Uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? Second. All right. Uh, all in favor? We're adjourned. Thank you.